How does man differ everything else on Earth? The University of Chicago presents the 1966 Britannica Lecture Series, The Difference of Man and the Difference It Makes. Our guest speaker for this series of five lectures about the position of man in the natural world is Mortimer J. Adler, director of the Institute for Philosophical Research. Today's presentation, the concluding lecture of the series, is titled, The Difference It Makes. Let me now summarize the positions reached in the course of the preceding lectures in the light of scientific evidences and philosophical arguments now available. I will do this first in relation to the question of degree versus kind, and second in relation to the question of superficial versus radical difference in kind. By virtue of the fact that man, man alone, manifests the power of propositional speech, man differs in kind from other animals, all of whom manifestly lack this power. As we have seen, this fact is agreed to by all reputable scientists. It represents, furthermore, the only point of agreement to which there is no serious dissent by reference to observed data of a contrary tenor. I'm simply saying here that, as far as I've searched the literature, there are no exceptions to this that I can find to this agreement. While man's unique possession of propositional speech is the only differentiating fact thus agreed to, universally agreed to, there are, as we have seen, other differentiating facts which a substantial, which a substantial number of scientists, with some dissents, point to as establishing man's, man's difference in kind from other animals. It is worth mentioning them here. They are listed in a descending order from those more generally agreed upon to those less generally agreed upon. In addition to the fact that only man makes sentences, only man makes tools, only man makes history by cumulative cultural transmission, only man makes laws or rules of behavior and thereby constitutes the different forms of his social life, only man makes pictures or statues for the non-utilitarian purpose of enjoyment, only man engages in ritualistic practices, only man has a moral conscience and a sense of value. That's the sending order of agreement. Hence, on the question whether man differs in kind or degree from other animals, the available evidence now supports the answer, man differs in kind. But I must remind you that this conclusion is tentative in the sense that it is based on the evidence now available and so does not preclude the possibility that evidence of a contrary tenor may be forthcoming in the future. We are obliged to ask ourselves, therefore, what effect contrary evidence would have should it ever be discovered and be generally agreed upon to the same extent as the fact that only man has propositional speech is now agreed upon. The easiest way of doing this is to suppose that at some future date it is, it is discovered that other animals, the bottle-nosed dolphin, the chimpanzee, or even the dog, can engage in propositional speech to some degree. I mention the dog because I have a very good friend who has bought an electric typewriter for her dog. We shall presently be concerned with the practical consequences that might follow from such possible future discoveries and from the inferences or conclusions to which they give rise. For the moment, I want to turn to the second question, the question with which, which we have dealt in the preceding lecture, the question whether the difference in kind between man and other animals is superficial or radical. This question, as we have seen, involves the question whether man's power of conceptual thought can be entirely explained in terms of neurophysiological processes. In other words, whether the human brain is not just a necessary, but is by itself the sufficient condition of man's having and exercising the power of conceptual thought. With regard to this question, our examination of the scientific evidences and the philosophical arguments now available made the following points clear. First, the philosophical arguments for a thoroughgoing materialism assert the answer that the brain is the sufficient condition, that the difference in kind is therefore superficial, involving a critical threshold in a continuum of degrees of brain magnitudes. The philosophical arguments against a thoroughgoing materialism assert the opposite answer, namely, that the brain is only a necessary condition, and hence that another and immaterial factor is required to explain conceptual thought. On this view, 
the difference in kind between man and other animals becomes radical. I shall, in the remainder of this lecture, refer to these two philosophical assertions and the arguments in, in support of them as respectively the materialist and the immaterialist hypothesis. Now these opposed philosophical arguments are deadlocked in the sense that neither of the opponents has as yet been able to persuade the other. And I venture to say that they probably would remain deadlocked until the end of time. The scientific data at present available leave the philosophical issue unresolved, nor can it be said that there is any neurological evidence that favors one side rather than the other. In addition, we saw in Lecture 5 that future neurological research cannot ever by itself be decisive on the question whether the brain is a necessary, a necessary, or the sufficient condition of conceptual thought. Finally, we see that the future does contain the possibility of efforts by technologists to build a robot that will meet the Cartesian challenge, a robot that will be able to play Turing's game successfully, or in other words, a machine that will use an ordinary language such as English and engage in conversation with men. I shall, in the remainder of this lecture, refer to Turing's game and Turing's robot as the conversational machine test of the hypothesis that material factors suffice to explain linguistic performances and hence to explain conceptual thought. The future, therefore, and this whole lecture is concerned with the future, the future, therefore, contains two further possibilities. One is that the conversational machine test will eventually succeed and by so doing will decisively falsify the, decisively falsify the immaterialist hypothesis, leaving the materialist position in command of the field. If that result is reached, the answer to our second question must be that the difference in kind between men and other animals is only superficial. The other possibility is that with repeated trials, the conversational machine test will not succeed, and by failing to do so, will confirm the truth of the immaterialist hypothesis, or at least add weight to the arguments it brings to bear against the materialist position, the position that predicts success in the conversational machine test. If that result is, is reached, the answer to our second question must favor the other alternative, namely, that the difference in kind between men and other animals is radical. The foregoing summary of the preceding lectures is intended to set the stage for the problem with which this final lecture is concerned, the problem of the theoretical and practical consequences that flow from opposite answers to the question about how man differs. I turn at once to the consequences of saying that man differs in kind, and say, or saying that he differs, taking these alternatives, differs in kind, or differs only in degree. Different attitudes can be and are taken toward the problem of drawing practical consequences from the fact that man differs from other animals in kind or only in degree. On the one hand, there are those who maintain that the difference between the way in which we treat men and the way in which we treat other animals is in no way dependent on or affected by how man differs from other animals. Our differential conduct toward man and beast is emotionally, not rationally motivated. Or if it is not wholly emotional, its reasons are purely reasons of expediency, not reasons of principle. If the fact is that men and other animals differ in kind, we can, of course, use that fact to justify the different kinds of treatment we accord men and other animals. But if the fact is that men and other animals differ only in degree, we can find other ways of justifying a differential treatment of men and other animals. It might suffice to argue that one kind of treatment is appropriate for members of our own species, and another kind for other species, even if all the differences among species are only differences in degree. In short, this position, one that I do not hold, you will see in a moment, this position uh, uh, says that the ultimate reason why we treat men as we do, or attribute to them a certain respect or dignity that we deny our other animals, or excoriate the enslavement, exploitation, and consumption of men, but not of animals, is that we like the results, we like the results. 
such policies produce for ourselves and our fellow men. If the facts of the matter tend to support such policies, well and good. But if they do not, no matter, for we can find other ways equally good of justifying the policies we like or think it expedient to act on. There are those, and I am one of them, who maintain that sound policies for the conduct of our relations with other, our fellow men and for our quite different treatment of other animals must be based on the nature of man, on the nature of other animals, and on the character of the difference between them. For example, I would say that if man differs only in degree from other animals, then a sharp line cannot be drawn to separate the world of persons from the world of things. In fact, the distinction between person and thing becomes meaningless if there are only differences in degree, since that distinction is either a distinction in kind or no distinction at all. I would maintain, furthermore, that the special dignity and respect accorded persons and not accorded things is based on an argument that involves two premises, one a normative or ought premise, the other a factual or is premise. The normative premise consists in the proposition that persons ought to be treated in a certain way, different from the way in which we treat things. Their lives and liberties ought to be respected. We ought not to use them merely as means. We ought not to make chattel slaves of them. We ought not to consume them as food, and so on and so on. The factual premise consists in the proposition that men are persons and other animals are things. I am not here saying what must be true in order to establish the proposition that men are persons and other animals are things. I am content to rest my case here on the point that if men and other animals differ only in degree, the whole distinction between person and thing evaporates, and we are left with no argument of this sort to justify our differential treatment of men and other animals. At this point, I must face up to the obvious objection from the man who takes the other attitude towards such matters. He claims that we don't need an argument of this sort to justify our conduct. We can find other ways of doing it, just as good. I cannot deny that other ways of justifying our conduct are possible. I know they have been used. I can only claim that they are not just as good. These other ways of justifying our conduct are all ad hoc. They are all rationalizations of what we want to do rather than reasons of principle. Those who want to do the opposite things can find ways of rationalizing and thus justifying their opposite purposes. Thus, for example, if we want to treat men differently from animals, even though they differ only in degree, we can justify this by saying that men all belong to the same species. But if some men, as some men have, want to treat other men as men treat animals, using them as means, enslaving them, or killing them for expediency's sake, they can also justify this by saying that even though all men belong to the same species, nevertheless, some men are superior in degree to other men. And so superior men are justified in treating inferior men as men treat other animals who are inferior in degree. In contrast, when we confine ourselves to justifying our conduct by appealing to normative principles and the facts of the case, we cannot justify opposite lines of conduct. If the principles and facts dictate one line of conduct, they preclude support for or justification of the opposite. This is the one clear advantage of conduct that is principled over unprincipled conduct, even though the latter can be justified in some ad hoc fashion. Within the scope of the present lecture, I cannot argue further for the position I am here taking, namely that conduct should be principled, and that when it is, the facts of nature have practical consequences. My further analysis of the practical consequences of saying that man differs in kind or only in degree will be of interest only to those who agree with me about this point. Those who do not, and there may be some in this audience, will of course continue to say that it makes no practical difference at all how, in fact, man differs from other animals, whether in kind or in degree. Now, as an initial step toward seeing the practical consequences that flow from asserting or denying difference in kind, I propose to examine some contemporary views of the matter, the opinions of a number of scientists and philosophers who have faced up to this problem one way or another. Let me first present the warning given us by 
our friend Dr. John Lilly, who, you will recall, thinks that it may be possible in the not-too-remote future to engage in a two-way conversation with the bottle-nosed dolphin. If and when this occurs, according to Dr. Lilly, we will have to attribute to dolphins the same kind of intellectual power that we attribute to men and deny to other non-speaking animals. In other words, though men and dolphins may differ in the degree of their common intellectual power, they will stand on the same side of the line that divides animals that have such power from animals that totally lack it. Men and dolphins together will differ in kind from other animals. Would this possible state of facts, if realized, have any practical consequences? Dr. Lilly thinks it would. He writes, I'd like to give you an extensive quotation. Quote, the day that communication is established and the, dol the dolphin becomes a legal, ethical, moral, and social problem. Dolphins correspond very loosely to conserved wild animals under the protection of the conservation laws of the United States and by international agreement, and to pets under the protection of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. But if, quote, if they achieve a bilateral conversational level corresponding, say, to a low-grade moron and well above a human imbecile or idiot, then they become an ethical, legal, and social problem. They have reached the threshold of humanness, as it were. If they go above this level, the problem becomes more and more acute. And if they reach the conversational abilities of any normal human being, we are in for trouble. Some groups of humans will then step forward in defense of these animals' lives and stop their use in experimentation. They will insist that we treat them as humans and that we give them medical and legal protection. And uh, I wish to add to this a United Press dispatch from Moscow of March 13th, 1966. The dispatch reads, the Soviet government announced Saturday it has banned the catching and killing of dolphins because their brains are strikingly close to our own. Fisheries Minister Alexander A. Ishkov said the decision was taken after extensive research showed that the dolphin's brain power makes, the marine, makes them marine brothers of man. Ishkov indicated he accepted theories that dolphins can talk. They eventually be able to teach their language to man. We will hope other countries will follow our example, Ishkov said in, the, in Isvestia. Isvestia added that dolphins have a comradely spirit. And so Let us next consider the view expressed by Professor Michael Scriven in the postscript to an article of his entitled The Mechanical Concept of Mind. Professor Scriven is concerned with the question whether a robot that is successful at playing Turing's game can also pass a test that would require us to attribute consciousness to the robot. He says, I quote, with respect to all other performances and skills of which the human being is capable, it seems to me clear already that robots can be designed to do as well or better. With respect to this performance, the one that would be the test of the robot's consciousness, Scriven says that he was not certain at the time of writing the article, but in the postscript he tells us that he is, I quote, upon further deliberation, confident that robots can in principle be built that will pass this test too, because they are in fact conscious. We need not agree with Scriven's prediction about the behavior of some future robot in order to take account of his comment on the practical consequences of his predictions coming true. On the outcome of his prediction depends, in his judgment, not only the question of matching a performance, a human performance, but also the, these are his words, not mine, also the crucial ontological question of the status of the robot as a person, and thence the propriety of saying that it knows or believes or remembers. If it is a person, Scriven goes on to say, of course it will have moral rights and hence political rights. I take turn next to the reflections of Professor Wilfred Sellers on what it means to be a person rather than a thing, and on the criteria for drawing the line that divides persons from things. Sellers writes, I quote, to think of a featherless biped as a person is to think of it as, being, as a being with which one is bound up in a network of rights and duties. From this point of view, the irreducibility of the personal is the irreducibility of the ought to the is. But even more basic than this is the fact that to think of a featherless biped as a person is to construe its behavior in terms of actual or potential membership in an embracing group, each member of which thinks itself a member, member of that group. Such a group, according to Sellers, is a community of persons. From the point of view of each of us as an individual, 
the most embracing community of persons to which we belong, listen to this now, includes, I quote these words, all those with whom we can enter into meaningful discourse. To recognize a featherless biped, or a dolphin, or a Martian, and Sellers might have added, or a robot, as a person, is to think of oneself and it as belonging to a community, the group of those who can engage in meaningful discourse with one another. Notice the criterion here of being a person or a member of a community of persons. It is the same conversational test that Lily and Scriv Scriven use for deciding whether dolphins and robots are persons or things. And that same criterion, conversational ability or ability to engage in meaningful discourse, also operates to differentiate man from brute. In other words, the same line that divides man from brute as different in kind also divides person from thing as different in kind. Furthermore, as Lilly, Scriven, and Sellers all point out, how we treat a particular entity depends on which side of the line we place it. These authors would therefore seem to be maintaining that a difference in kind has practical, legal, ethical, and social consequences. Let me now summarize briefly the practical consequences of the opposed answers to the question about how man differs from other animals, in kind or in degree only. First of all, I must remind you that we are, not here, we are here not concerned with the further question about whether the difference in kind is superficial or radical. We'll come to that in a moment. Let us assume for the moment that the difference in kind that is established by man's having and by all other, all other animals lacking the power of propositional speech is only a superficial difference in kind. Let us assume, in other words, that the power of conceptual thought to be inferred as present in man, but not in other animals, can be entirely explained in neurophysiological terms, and that its presence in man and its absence in other animals can be explained by the size and complexity of the human brain, which is above the critical threshold of magnitude required for conceptual thought. On these assumptions, these are minimal assumptions, on these assumptions about the observed fact that man differs in kind from other animals, is man a person rather than a thing? In terms of the traditional theological definition of a person as one who is made in the image of God, himself preeminently a person, the answer is negative. Man is not a person in this sense, if he is wholly a material being, with no immaterial aspect or component of his nature. In terms of Kant's, Immanuel Kant's strict definition of a person, the answer is also negative. For Kant conceives a person as a being with free choice. And for Kant, as well as for most philosophers who affirm freedom of choice, such contra-causal freedom cannot exist in a purely material or mechanical system. But as we have seen, the line that divides persons from things can be drawn by less exacting criteria, such as conversational ability, the ability to engage in meaningful discourse, the ability to give and receive reasons or arguments. By these less exacting criteria, man is, by these less, very slight criteria, man is at present the only being on earth that is a person. All other animals and machines, so far at least, so far at least, are things not persons. The special worth or dignity of man that belongs exclusively to persons, the respect that must be accorded to persons, the fundamental imperative that commands us to treat persons as ends, never solely as means, all these obtain even on this diminished view of what is involved in being a person. If in the future we should discover that dolphins too, or certain robots, are persons in the same sense, then they too would have a dignity, deserve a respect, and impose certain obligations on us that other animals and other machines would not. Finally, if in the future we should discover that throughout nature, throughout the world of living things and machines, there are only differences in degree and not a single difference in kind, at that moment, the line that divides the realm of persons from the realm of things would be rubbed out, and with its disappearance would go the basis, in fact, for a principal policy of treating men differently from the way we now treat other animals and machines. I've dealt with the practical consequences, consequences for our action, for our policies of conduct, our rules of treatment, 
based upon one point, kind or degree. I'm turning now to a rather different era, uh, realm of discussion. I want to consider now with you the consequences of affirming or denying that man is a purely material being. Well, what is equivalent? The consequences of saying that the difference in kind between men and other animals is superficial or that it is radical. Permit me a few preliminary and I hope clarifying remarks. The consequences we have just been considering, as I pointed out, were mainly practical. They concerned our conduct, the ways in which we treat men on the one hand and machines and brute animals on the other. In addition to that point, which you are fully aware of now, the aforementioned practical consequences, one way or the other, affect the lives of everyone, the ordinary man, the man on the street, as well as the man of specialized learning, the man in the academy. In, in contrast, the consequences to which we now turn are largely, if not wholly, theoretical, and as such, their primary effect is in the sophisticated world of learning. Let us first consider the effect of confirming the truth, confirming the truth of the materialist hypothesis, the effect and the effect which is the same of falsifying, falsifying the immaterialist hypothesis. Now there are two questions to consider here, not one. It is not enough to ask what theoretical consequences would follow from the experimental success with a Turing machine a robot that would pass the conversational test and satisfactorily meet the Cartesian challenge. We must also ask, in what sphere of learning the theoretical consequences would occur, in religion or in philosophy? And in each case, we must specify the doctrinal commitment of those who would be seriously affected. I am going to answer the second question first. The most important effects, as I see them, would be in the field of religion. There would also be, I think, a consequence in the realm of philosophy, but I will come to that later. Let us concentrate for the moment on the religious consequences and ask, consequences for whom? For which religious group? What doctrinal commitments define the religious group that would be affected by confirming the materialist hypothesis and f by falsifying the immaterialist hypothesis? I think I can describe it once. Those whom I think would not be affected, not be affected by the falsification of the immaterialist hypothesis concerning man's nature and concerning his radical difference in kind.